The plan today is to say a few more things about moduli spaces of 3D n equals 4 theories um, than to explain what 3D mirror symmetry is, um, and then to start quantizing things um, and uh, deforming, deforming the rings of functions on, on the moduli spaces. Um, so let me, let me recall um, a 3D n equals 4 gauge theory is defined by a gauge group G, um, some compact B group, um, and a representation um, on T star of C to N to the N for some integer N um, that preserves the hyperkähler structure <coughs> of, of T star of C. In terms of fields uh, for um, associated to the gauge group, uh, there are vector multiplets uh, whose bosonic fields consist of a connection, a complex scalar, and a real scalar, all in the Lie algebra of G. And Associated to the representation, there are hy hypermultiplets whose bosonic fields consist of pairs of scalars uh, xi, uh, pair, pairs of complex scalars xi and yi. Uh, and the parameters of the theory are uh, first gauge couplings. Uh, for every for every factor in the gauge group, um, as well as mass parameters um, real and complex uh, that live in the Cartan of of the isometry group of the hypermultiplets, um, the isometry group that commutes um, that commutes and is independent of G. So, uh, so this is a group acting on V uh, independently of G, um, and Fi parameters real and <coughs> complex that uh, live in a carton of the isometry group of the vector multiplets, which G Coulomb, uh, which classically is U1 to the number of U1s in in the gauge group. Um, and so recall that for every U1 in the gauge group, we can dualize um, we can dualize the gauge connection to a scalar. And this, uh, this global symmetry group uh, acts by shifting, by shifting those periodic scalars. Ah, um, so they um, they enter uh, they enter the mo the real and complex moment maps for hyperkähler quotients. 
uh, when I when working out when working out the Higgs branch. Uh, what what they what they appear as is in the in the action is uh, as as terms multiplying some some vector multiplet superfield. Uh, It is. Um, it depends what kind of supersymmetry we're we're talking about. Um, so, um, so if in order to write a supersymmetric Lagrangian, uh, or to write a, a Lagrangian in superspace, uh, you can't actually use n equals four supersymmetry. You have to use uh, to write everything in, in n equals two language. And then the real Fi is the thing that um, that you would have gotten <coughs> from four dimensions if you're familiar with four dimensional. Uh, n equals one Lagrangians. Uh, the complex Fi is a superpotential coupling uh, that that involves the field phi, which which enters a, a superpotential. But they are all, everything is part of the same kind of big n equals four vector multiplet. Uh, so uh, so the the moduli space of vacua uh, is. Uh, is given as uh, classically as solutions to dW equals dH equals zero mod G. Uh, where W involves complex moment maps. Uh, uh, so a complex, so complex uh, complex moment maps, which typically are bilinear, uh, bilinear in the x's and the y's, um, and may also may also involve phi uh, if if the gauge group is not abelian. Uh, so there is a complex moment map for the gauge group action, uh, which gets dotted into phi. There is a complex moment map for the flavor group G Higgs which gets dotted into M. And then there's this complex Fi parameter, which enters there. Um, and there's uh, a, real, uh, a real superpotential, which is not part. Uh, it's, it's not an actual superpotential in the n equals 2 version of the Lagrangian, but it is one in the n equals 1 version of the Lagrangian. And the fact that. I have imposed an artificial splitting into real and complex. Uh, well, should tell me that if I have a complex superpotential, I should have some kind of real, real counterpart, and they're all rotated by, by hypercalar um, isometries. In other words, by the R symmetry of the theory. Um, so, the uh, the real superpotential is the same thing with real moment maps. And the sigma fields um, in the vector multiples. Uh, so, if the masses are zero, if the masses and, and the FIs are all zero, uh, the Higgs branch um, is uh, is the part of the moduli space that you get by setting sigma and phi equal to zero, and uh, doing a singular hypercalar quotient, uh, setting the complex moment map for the gauge group equal to zero, and the real moment map for the gauge group equal to zero, and dividing by g. Um, uh, it's a singular cone, and its dimension, uh, its complex dimension, uh, is just two n minus two dim g. Uh, similarly, uh, there's a classical Coulomb branch, uh, which is obtained by setting x and y to zero, which basically kills all of these equations, uh, and it and sigma and phi are free. Uh, you can fix their eigenvalues. Um, and those, along with the dual photons, the gammas, uh, parameterize a Coulomb branch that's of the form R3 times S1, 
uh, to the rank of G uh, modulo the vial group. And the dimension of this is simply uh, twice the rank of G. Um, now, the, as I said yesterday, um, the Higgs branch is, uh, is exact. The classical description survives at, uh, uh, survives quantum, well, it has no quantum corrections, and it's, it's accurate uh, at all scales. The, uh, the Coulomb branch uh, gets severe quantum corrections, uh, both to its topology and to its metric. Um, so corrections to the metric are easiest to describe. Yeah, that's okay. What about it? Hmm? What about it? I mean, how do you correct? Why, why would, what does it mean that the topology would be quantum correct? Um, as I'll say in a second, uh, maybe I should say it now. So, um, well, David already said it. Uh, these, the moduli space can be understood as, uh, it's, it's parameterized by the expectation values of certain operators. Uh, by, by analyzing those expectation values, uh, on, for, for the Coulomb branch, where the operators are actually disorder operators, uh, one can see that the vibration uh, of S1 over R3 at, uh, at the boundary of R3 uh, actually has a non-trivial Euler class. Uh, if, 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 you, if, if you look at the theory in the background of, of a disorder operator. Uh, and so, so as I've written it, the uh, there's an S1 bundle over, over the boundary of R3, in other words, over S2, uh, that has trivial Euler class. And that, that thing is, uh, is, is, is modified in, in the quantum theory. Uh, and, and that's, so, so there's some, some number that results out of a calculation of fermion zero modes in the presence of a monopole operator uh, that, uh, that gives a topological obstruction to this thing being trivial. Uh, So in, in the quantum, I think the way to say it is that, that in the quantum theory, uh, the spectrum of the ring, the relevant ring of operators uh, is not R3 times S1, but something topologically non -trivial. I hope that helps a little bit. Um, Uh, but, right, so, so what, what actually happens at low energies? Uh, so if you stick in quantum corrections, the most interesting of which are, are the ones that change the topology, um, and go to low energy, which means take all of the gauge couplings to infinity, uh, then the Coulomb branch becomes a hypercalar cone. Uh, just like the Higgs branch. Um, so at low energies, the gauge theory uh, becomes a scale invariant. So low energy. The gauge theory becomes a scale invariant theory, uh, in fact, a conformal field theory, whose moduli space of vacua or whose moduli space, rather, uh, as parameterized by this ring of operators, has at least two branches, a Coulomb branch and a Higgs branch, that, that, meet, uh, that meet at the origin. There may be other components to the moduli space as well, so-called mixed branches, uh, as came up in Andy's talk. Uh, there, 
easy to, de easy to describe classically. Um, they occur um, they occur on strata of the Higgs branch um, when um, that have a non-trivial stabilizer uh, in the hyperkähler quotient. So, um, so mixed branches. Um, so suppose um, uh, should I say this? Um, so suppose there are solutions uh, to uh, to the complex moment to to the moment map equations mu c this mu r equals zero. So this is in uh, x y space. Uh, that uh, that have a non-trivial stabilizer uh, some group G prime in G uh, then under the hyperkähler quotient uh, and this this submanifold of XY space uh, gets mapped uh, so I then quotient quotient by G uh, I, I get some uh, submanifold uh, S uh, inside inside the Higgs branch. Um, this this is certainly part of part of the solutions to uh, my vacuum equations. But in addition, there is some unbroken gauge group, uh, the stabilizer G prime, um, and either by analyzing the equations, uh, well, by analyzing the equations. Uh, one, one can see that the field sigma and phi can be turned on. Uh, the, the sigma and phi uh, parts in this, inside this G prime can be turned on uh, in addition to the x's and y's. Uh, so, uh, so classically, one gets part of, a part of the moduli space uh, that looks like some submanifold of the Coulomb branch. Call this S H. Uh, times some submanifold of of the Higgs branch, uh, so this has the sigma and phi's inside uh, the the algebra of that G prime. Um, so so there may be components like this as well. Um, okay. Now. Uh, so I had said it before. I, I want to reemphasize that a useful concept in topological and many supersymmetric theories um, is that of parameterizing the moduli space by expectation values of operators. Um, so David talked about the topological version of this. Um, in supersymmetric theories, uh, there is what's so-called a chiral ring. as long as there's enough supersymmetry. And here we have quite a lot. Um, so there exist local operators um, in, a, in a supersymmetric theory that are preserved by some of the supersymmetries. Um, so invariant under some Qs. Um, that um, where the invariance under some of the supersymmetry ensures that their expectation values don't depend on position. Um, so the only thing that the expectation value depends on uh, is, uh, is a vacuum, basically, for the theory uh, that this expectation value is taken in. Uh, there's uh, there's a multipl multiplicative structure, a commutative multiplicative structure uh, on, on the operators in dimensions two and higher, at least, uh, that, that turns the space of such operators into a ring. Uh, that's the so-called chiral ring of the theory. Um, now, in 3D n equals 4, 
uh, there are two chiral rings. Well, there, there are actually infinitely many chiral rings, uh, but they come in two types. Um, one of them um, parameterizes holomorphic functions on the Higgs branch. The other one parameterizes holomorphic functions on, on the Coulomb branch. So there is a Higgs branch chiral ring that is really it's the ring of functions on the Higgs branch. Um, uh, the, operators, the operators in this ring uh, are typically formed from, com from gauge invariant combinations of the x's and y's. Um, of the hypermultiplet fields, which <coughs> makes, makes sense because those are the things that parameterize, well, those are the fields involved in, in the Higgs branch. Um, there's also a Coulomb branch chiral ring. Um, the difference between them is, uh, is the supersymmetries that uh, preserve the relevant operators uh, or the respective operators. Uh, so the Coulomb branch chiral ring uh, includes gauge invariant polynomials um, in phi, um, as well as what are called monopole operators. Uh, and so these are the, the, the disorder operators that, that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, in schematically, um, so monopole <coughs> operators, um, they have, have various descriptions um, on them the alpha. So uh, schematically, they're formed, uh, and, and quite uh, directly in an abelian theory, they're, they're formed uh, from Uh, from sigma and abelian dual photons. Uh, so in, in an abelian theory, uh, the monopole operators, there are two of them, uh, look uh, in, at high energies can be described as e to the one, o one over the gauge coupling squared uh, sigma plus i gamma. And the reason that the gauge coupling is in there, well, one, it has to be there uh, on dimensional grounds because sigma has mass dimension one and so does the gauge coupling. Um, and one also sees it from the periodicity of, of that dual photon field. Uh, hmm? Yes? Yeah. Um, uh, is, is that what's going on here, or is um, uh, that's what's going on here? Is that your so on the on the both ends on the ends? Yeah. This theory is built to like maths with three dimensional fields. Okay. So if you if you look at the math that is supplied by the cross homologies, that math could have a single argument for you. Cross homologies. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm about to say it. So, uh, so more, more generally, uh, these can be defined as disorder operators uh, specifying a singularity at a point. So they're local operators uh, at a point x 
uh, that's obtained by embedding uh, a U1 monopole uh, configuration uh, into G. So the alphas are ways of embedding U1 into G, in other words, co -weights. Uh, this is uh, this is the same uh, way that uh, that it, it hoofed operators are described in in four dimensional theories um, or uh, Hecke correspondences have have the same the same labeling. Um, okay. Um, now, what happens when I turn some of the M's and T's on? Um, this may be a question that's been answered in some form or another, but why do you expect the functions on the underlying vacuum to be labeled by local operators and not an extension of the SM1 operator? Well, um, a silly answer is that expectation values of line operators are not, not finite unless, uh, unless, unless I've compactified the theory somehow. Um, hmm? Yeah, no, you, yeah, you, you, you do. Um, I, so, so the, I, 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 I think the simplest reason is that I'm working in R3, um, and I, and I want operators whose expectation values make sense. Um, and, and I, I, I can have a line operator, but if it's infinite, uh, I, it doesn't, it doesn't actually make sense to take its expectation value in R3. Um, I can take the expectation values, value values of other things in the presence of the line operator, but the line operator itself is, is, is some one-dimensional theory. Um, so, right, in, if, if I compactify a little bit, I don't have an infinite line, but you know, some loop or something like that, then there's, there's no problem. That is also going to be some kind of function on the moduli space. Uh, but then what also, one also needs, I mean, to actually get a function on the moduli space, one needs to make sure that the expectation value is independent of the position or of the operator, or in the case of the line operator, that it's independent of how you wiggle it around. Um, and that'll be true in a topological theory, but it, it, it certainly won't be true. You get a function, it's just not a function that's sort of easy to say anything about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks. From the point of view of infinity, then like a closed loop looks very much like a point. Yep. You can approximate it pretty well by a Right, and so and indeed, and so so if if I dimensionally reduce the theory by putting it on a circle, line operators wrapping the circle are going to become local operators in in the dimensionally reduced theory. Um, so right, so I think the answer is you can and you should think about them, but but they they're not relevant here. So they, they can always be written as parentheses. Uh, no. No. Um, They're, no, no, no. I mean, they're independent operators. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Are you, are, are you making the claim that M <coughs> is spec of the associated power line? Yes, I am. Okay. So then, all functions on it are in terms of can be written in terms of these guys in the spiral ring. Yes. Well, I was asking about Hallmark. It was just, he said they take a line, take a loop, put it, line up, put it, 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 put
so wait, so so there. So, so you, you 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 certainly do if you, if you do something very silly, uh, like like have have a line that that wiggles. Uh, I mean, y y it it will depend on every single detail of that line. There may be some nice class of line operators in these theories. Um, wait, I mean, you need line operators that that are preserved under the same supersymmetries as as the chiral ring, and I don't I don't think those exist here. Um, 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 it's sorry. So it's 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 a it's a good question. Um, it's a yeah. Um, okay. So. All right, so let me try to deform, deform things a little bit. So um, if, I, if I turn on Fi parameters, then the Higgs branch uh, gets resolved. Uh, well, it's, it's in the complex structure I've chosen. It's resolved uh, if I turn on a real Fi and it's deformed. Um, if, I, if I turn on a complex Fi. Uh, the Coulomb branch uh, is just becomes massive, uh, meaning that uh, that any excitations away from the origin have some mass. In terms of vacua, the only vacuum uh, lies at the origin. Uh, so there's there's a single vacuum at the origin. Um, and um, right, so so if I look then at uh, at this theory at low energies, uh, comparable comparable to T, uh, well, really a little bit less than T, uh, then the gauge theory starts looking like a sigma model. The um, the only the only light uh, propagating degrees of freedom in the theory are along uh, this vacuum ma manifold, along the moduli space. Uh, excitations transverse uh, to the moduli space uh, become frozen out. Uh, so, uh, so at such energies, the gauge theory uh, becomes well approximated uh, by a sigma model. Uh, with target MH. Um, and the opposite thing is true. If I turn on generic masses and kill the Fi parameters, uh, then the Higgs branch has a single vacuum at the origin, and the Coulomb branch is resolved or deformed depending on whether I turn on real or complex parameters. So, so what would be the explanation for why this is like a sigma model? Well, so, so a, a sigma model is, is a theory of maps from R3 into, into some target space. Um, and uh, the gauge theory has a lot more than that. Uh, it can have... Um, excitations of fields that lie nowhere near uh, this manifold of vacua. Uh, but at, at low energies, uh, all of the excitations transverse to the vacuum manifold uh, get frozen out. Uh, and so the only, the only excitations that survive are along, along the vacuum manifold. And that's, that's precisely the description of the sigma. Uh, the most interesting case uh, for symplectic duality is when both masses and Fi parameters are turned on and the energy scale is, uh, is moved up and down. So, uh, so turn on both masses and Fi's, then what happens? 
Um, the theory is fully massive. Um, in, in nice cases, there are a finite uh, number of isolated, uh, of isolated vacua. And these vacua can either be understood as fixed points of, of, of a U1 inside the Higgs flavor group um, on the Higgs branch, uh, or fixed points of U1, in, of some U1 inside the Coulomb flavor group on the Coulomb branch. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, the, uh, let me just consider the case where I've turned on real masses and real FI parameters and left the complex ones out of it. Um, those real parameters define an embedding of U1 uh, into, uh, sorry, the real mass parameters define an embedding of U1 into the isometry group of the Higgs branch. And similarly, uh, the, uh, the real FI parameters do the same thing for the isometry group of, of the Coulomb branch. Uh, and so one gets a picture where both branches are resolved, but the theory just has vacua at a few points. Um, there, I mean, so, so in general, in a quantum field theory, you would not necessarily expect the vacua to be connected to symmetries in any way. It's just that we have a theory with a whole lot of supersymmetry. Um, and in this particular theory, everything is controlled by, by the structure of the symmetry groups. Um, so then we can play the following game. Uh, we can turn on uh, some m naught and t naught to make the theory fully massive. Um, and, then, uh, and then scale things. Uh, so, starting in uh, the massive gauge theory with these values of m naught and t naught, uh, we can scale the m's up by a factor of lambda and the t's down by a factor of lambda, uh, so that as lambda goes to zero, uh, the t's become huge, the m's become very small, and effectively the theory is described as a very, uh, very lightly massive uh, sigma model uh, to the Higgs branch, where we can almost neglect the fact that, that it's massive. All of the excitations are still around. And as lambda goes to infinity, we get um, again a very lightly massive sigma model to the Coulomb branch. And thinking about energy scales, what I mean here um, is that the energy we're, me we're measuring the theory at um, is less than the effective Fi and bigger than the effective mass and, well, the opposite thing on the other side. Okay. Um, so now let me go through an explicit example. Can you explain actually a little bit more about uh, what is going on physically with the resolve versus the form? Oh, um, I mean, I, I, so, Well, so, so it's, it's easiest to see in the hyperkähler quotient description. I mean, mathematically, I know what's going on. Okay. Yeah, so, but, but like, what is the, I mean, uh, physically, what does it mean the modified phase of vacuum is changing? What, what's that? Mean? 
I said, Ten you offensive and didn't know the hyper the, the Torah hyper story. Hyper Torah story. Then how would you learn what was going on before you ended? Um So if we, if we have the gauge theory to start with, then we have these equations that we solve. Let's assume the classical description holds. And then, uh, well, then what I just said is, I, I think, a accurate. You're solving some equations. Their solutions may or may not be singular. Uh, now, the, the more physical interpretation of this is to look at the CFT. Um, so uh, to think of turning on M and T as deformations, not of the gauge theory, but of the CFT. Um, and so, so the CFT is something that really only knows about, about the moduli space. And it's, it's some strongly coupled theory that ex that whose fields have excitations around this maximally singular point. Uh, at the intersection of the Higgs and Coulomb branches. Um, turning on masses and FIs in that, in that setting um, takes, well, it, it describes how to, a ways to introduce a scale into what was a scale invariant theory. So, so it's, they're, they're deformations of a scale invariant theory that, um, No, smooth out the singularity structure. I understand, I understand how deforming something can deform the mod by space. What, what's not so clear is how to resolve the mod by space. Oh, but they're the same thing. I mean, and hyper, I mean as, as far as the hyperkähler structure goes. Um, I mean, it, in, if, if, I, if I make an artificial splitting of the n, n equals 4 supersymmetry into, into n equals 2, uh, Multiplets, then, then the operators that I stick into the Lagrangian of the theory, in order to, uh, to get one deform, what either a resolution or a deformation look look different. They look like different kinds of operators. And that, sorry, that's that's, I didn't understand the question. Uh, so, so the the distinction between the two has to do with the choice of complex structure, uh, which is a choice of subalgebra of three D n equals four. Let me let me try to answer it later. Yeah, sorry. Um, That's true. There's maybe one way of stating the question. So I have like some kind of fiber bundle over the space of parameters, and each fiber is like the moduli space of whatever. So I know what it means to like go to a different parameter, and I get a different space. But it's, it says something more if I claim that one of these spaces is the res resolution of the other, because it says that I have some kind of connection on this bundle. Does that yeah. sound like yeah, maybe. Fiber bundle, I don't automatically have a way of writing down maps between different fibers. Let me let me let me move on for the moment, and you can get back to this during during lunch. Um, okay, so um, I want to go through an example. Um, physicists would call this SQVD with n flavors. Um, so this is a gauge theory where the gauge group is U1. Um, that's, that's the QED part of it. And the representation is T star of C to the N for some integer N, uh, where the X's and Y's have weights plus 1 and minus 1 uh, under, uh, under the U1 action. Uh, and so here we have our usual fields, uh, sigma phi, and since everything is abelian, we can turn the connection into a dual photon. Now, um, I should also say, just um, it's a notational comment, that theories uh, 
sometimes written as, the, as that quiver uh, with a circle, circular node denoting the gauge group and a square node denoting the flavor group. Um, this is notation that's become popular over the past few years um, that is extremely convenient for describing n equals 4 theory. So, right, so let me explain again what's happening. Um, there's, uh, so the circular node says that there's a gauge symmetry U1. Uh, the square node uh, says that there's a global symmetry UN acting, in, uh, acting on the x's and y's. It, so um, the isometry group of xy space that commutes with the u1 action is un. Uh, only, uh, only the sun part of it is really independent of the u1. Um, and there are by fundamental um, hypermultiplets uh, for every line in the quiver, and there's only one, and these are them. These are they. <clears throat> OK. Uh, so now let me, uh, let me turn on uh, real mass NFI parameters. The superpotentials look as follows. Uh, the complex superpotential is phi xy. The real superpotential is sigma uh, x squared minus y squared. <laughs> Uh, plus a sum of mi xi squared minus yi squared plus sigma t. Uh, so what are the n's? Uh, they are sitting in the Cartan of, well, they're sitting in the Cartan of, of sun. Uh, and so there are n of them, and we can normalize them so that their sum is 0. Uh, and t is sitting in the Cartan of the u1 group that shifts the dual photon. Um, OK. Now, if, if the masses are all 0, uh, we get a resolved Higgs branch, uh, which looks like the hyperkähler quotient, except y equals 0 x squared <coughs> minus y squared uh, equals minus t mod u1. And this is t star of cp and minus 1. Um, if, uh, if the fi parameter t is positive, then the base of cp n minus 1 uh, is parameterized by the y's, and the fibers are parameterized by the x. And if t is negative, the opposite is true. Um, so the combination of x's and y's that goes into base and fiber coordinates depends on, on the value of the fi. Um, and so going from positive to negative is a, is a hyperkähler flop transition. Um, OK, if, uh, if the masses are not, uh, are not 0, uh, then there are n vacua uh, at fixed points <coughs> of some u1 inside sun uh, determined, determined by the mass parameters. Uh, and if, uh, if we parameterize the hypermultiplets properly, uh, then these vacua are just uh, are just the points, say, when t is negative, uh, x is a vector of zeros with square root of t mi uh, minus at some point. Uh, and so there are n ways to, to do that. Um, OK. Uh, and, and sorry, I, as an exercise, uh, one can find that description very, very explicitly by, uh, by trying to solve the full equations, looking at the full critical locus of W and H and seeing what combinations of sigma and phi fields and, uh, can, uh, can accompany the x's and y's when the masses are turned on. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so is the lambda equal to zero limit some kind of intermediate <coughs> between these two, or is it? 
Um, here? Yeah. I mean, if lambda is zero, then we just get a massless sure. resolved sigma model. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I mean, sure, it, it's, it, it tells you, it, it all depends on the value of big lambda. Um, so, so yes, in some sense, it's an intermediate regime. Um, okay, and the ring of functions on the Higgs branch, in other words, the chiral ring of the Higgs branch, uh, can be, well, can be described as a holomorphic symplectic quotient of the chiral ring of the x's and y's, uh, in this case. And so it's just uh, taking functions of the x's and y's, restricting to the u1 invariant part, and imposing a complex moment map. A really lovely way to describe that uh, is by putting all the bilinears xi, yj in a matrix. Uh, then, then the chiral ring is the entries of the matrix with the condition that the rank is 1 and the trace is 0. Uh, if there were a complex Fi parameter in the story, it would, it would deform that. What's GC in this case? You won. Um, acting. acting on the dual photon. Uh, it's a periodic scalar, and it, it rotates it. Um, OK. Now let's do the Coulomb branch. Um, so set t equal to 0 so that we get uh, something non-massive. Then, again, classically, it's R3 times S1. Um, if we look at a slice where phi is 0, it looks like a cylinder, uh, where the axis of the cylinder is the sigma direction, and going around the cylinder is the dual photon phi, or uh, gamma. Uh, now, quantum corrections change the topology in a very precise way in an abelian theory. Uh, the gamma fiber shrinks uh, for values of sigma and phi uh, such that the hypermultiplets, or some hypermultiplet, uh, becomes massless. Different what you thought it was sure. Yes. Is, is that correct? Is that how in practice you Yes, I think that's a concrete way of, of thinking about it. Um, <coughs> so what is what is hypers become massless mean? Um, I take a look at this function at W and H. So um, they are both quadratic functions in the x's and y's. The coefficients of, of a quadratic term in x and y are an, uh, play the role of an effective mass. Uh, from w, I see that these are points when phi equals 0. And from h, which I can write as a sum of sigma plus mi, x i squared minus y i squared plus sigma t, um, I see that. I get massless hypers whenever sigma uh, is equal to minus mi for some i. Um, that means that the corrected space looks like a sausage. Um, 
uh, where the dual photon circles has shrunk at minus mn, minus m, and minus 1, minus m1, at particular values of sigma. Uh, the way to describe this as, as a complex symplectic manifold Uh, to describe this as a complex symplectic manifold, we use the chiral ring operators. Um, so, you have Coulomb. Um, there's an operator phi, um, and there are monopole operators, B plus minus, which have the semi-classical description that I mentioned before as an exponential of sigma plus i gamma. Um, classically, v plus v minus is 1. Um, and that, that is the thing that gets corrected uh, to uh, phi to the n. Um, and if there are complex masses in the story, the full relation is v plus v minus is phi plus m1 complex, um, phi plus mn complex. Uh, so this is a C2 mod Zn singularity. Um, and this is a deformation of the C2 mod Zn singularity. Now, if, uh, if there is a real mass in the story, uh, the actual vacuum moduli space is a resolution of this, but I can't possibly see that by looking at holomorphic functions. Um, OK. So I um, wanted to say a few things about mirror symmetry, uh, but they're not they're relevant as general knowledge. They're not directly relevant for where I want to go next. Um, <coughs> But I should say the basic idea. So, yeah. Something amazing has happened in the last couple of minutes. Maybe I missed the concrete aspect of it. But you, you have two star CP at minus one, and then you have the surface resolution. And you explain that again, each of them by special like, like, everybody understood it all. Yes. Um, the, the only, so I haven't, I haven't discussed uh, categories or brains or any of that, but the only thing I have said is, is the picture that used to be over here with the arrows and the scaling of lambda. That, uh, that in one regime of parameter space, the theory looks like a sigma model uh, to C2 mod Zn resolved. And in another regime of parameter space, it looks like a sigma model uh, to, to T star P1. And, um, and the important words uh, are that the theory is massive everywhere between these regimes. Um, and so in, we would say that there, there are no phase transitions of, of the theory. So, so it's conceivable that one can compute um, perhaps some category of boundary conditions and expect that the category remains unchanged uh, as, as you go from one regime to, to the other. That there are no funny differentials turning on and off or anything like that. So mathematically that'd be realized by a function or some integral. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I, so I guess I'm just asking if that's already, you've already probably told us some I have. Uh, no, I, 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 well, what, what have I done? I've said that there's a gauge theory with, with two different, two different regimes. Um, and I, I think that's, 
I, I don't have uh, any kind of semi-classical equations that actually describe that transform at the level of, of categories uh, or Yes. Yes. Uh, but but they're y yes. So yeah, sorry. That that's that's, that's, that's exactly right. How do you describe this category in the massive? So. so so I have I will. No, but one can so one can do the following, uh, which which I, I will do. Uh, you can try to describe boundary conditions in in the gauge theory even before you start talking about any any kind of category. Let's just describe the objects, um, and um, boundary conditions in the gauge theory have a fairly uh, a fairly simple uh, analysis, and then one can ask. Uh, in, in these re regimes, so, sorry, I should also say boundary conditions in the gauge theory don't really care uh, whether the masses and FIs are turned on and off. Uh, the basic description at high energy could care less. Um, as I go to low energy, uh, I can move uh, either onto the Higgs branch or the Coulomb branch. Um, and, and there is some very explicit map. Uh, between the boundary conditions in the gauge theory and those on the Higgs and Coulomb branch. Only some of them survive, and the ones that survive, uh, th that depends on the values of M and T that I've actually turned on. Um, not, uh, it depends discreetly on, on the values of M and T. Um, so, so the set that survives is the same for, for the Higgs and the Coulomb branch. Um, but the, so the basic idea is start with boundary conditions in the gauge theory and see what they flow to. Um, on, on the two branches. And that, um, that describes some correspondence between the objects in the Higgs branch category and the objects in the Coulomb branch category. So uh, my colleague's been sitting next to me and telling me that um, what I should be thinking about uh, mathematically is that you know, these two spaces, they have the same t fixed points. And somehow you know, you're just like localizing whatever it is, the t fixed points, and identifying them. Um, I mean, that, that is morally. Is that a legitimate way to think? Um, let, me, let me answer it tomorrow okay. if <laughs> you get a chance. I mean, yes, that is morally what's happening, but it's a little more complicated. Um, but, yeah. I mean, part, part, of, part of the thing that, that makes the story work is that the fixed points are, there, there's a one to one correspondence of the fixed points. Uh, and so I, I didn't say that explicitly, but there are n fixed points uh, in T star of, of Pn minus 1, and there are n fixed points of the isometry that rotates the dual photon on, on the Coulomb branch. Um, and, and they are in one-to-one -one correspondence. Uh, the, a vacuum of the theory of the fully massive theory is not living on one branch or the other. It is, it is living at both on one of these fixed points. Um, it is, uh, it's what happens if, in Andy's theory, um, if uh, you start with a four-dimensional theory on, on a finite radius circle, then, then you get a periodic direction, an extra periodic direction. Um, okay, so mirror symmetry in two seconds. Uh, the Coulomb branches of these 3dn equals 4 theories are not hyperkähler quotients in general. They, this, this has certainly did not come about as any kind of hyperkähler reduction. Um, in some, I think, relatively small family of nice cases, uh, given all the possible theories that are out there, uh, there are pairs of gauge theories, TNT prime, uh, whose Higgs and Coulomb branches are exchanged. And that's what's usually known, uh, what's usually known as 3D mirror symmetry. Um, 
the Higgs and Coulomb branches are exchanged, the rows of M's and T's are exchanged, and the SU2, the two SU2s and the R symmetry group are exchanged. Um, now, if, if I have two mirror gauge theories like this, T and T prime, um, then I can obviously use the Higgs branch of T prime, which is a lovely hyperkähler quotient, to compute everything I want to about the Coulomb branch of T. Um, abelian theories all have mirrors, um, and some small family of non-abelian quiver gauge theories have mirrors, for example, linear quivers. Um, in, in particular, the triangular quiver Um, has a moduli space that's T star of the SLN flag variety, um, and that's mirrored to itself. Um, okay. Um, so I think I have again gone through about half of the talk, um, and I'm pretty much out of time. Um, There's a discussion section this afternoon. Great. Thanks. Thank you.